Time to get some practice using dynamic memory allocation, which of course is always heralded by the use of the malloc and free functions. There have been a few times, especially in the last few videos, where I've had to dismiss an exercise because it would seem to need dynamic memory allocation. So one example was that exercise involving CSV files, where I said, we're going to assume the number of columns is always three. Well, we don't actually have to do that. It's just that to the easy way around that, or the only way around that that would have made any sense in a context of a course like this, would have involved malloc and free, and we didn't know about those yet. Uh, and even when we were talking about structures, uh, so in the last video, we had to make a few assumptions uh, about the maximum length of a book title or a person's name because the alternative would have required malloc and free, which we didn't know about yet. So I'm going to start by asking ChatGPT for exercises about dynamic memory. And if that fails, then I'll actually specifically refer to malloc and free. And if it still doesn't give me anything interesting, maybe I could just ask it to sort of return and give me some of those structure exercises or file exercises from before. Because I do sort of want to return to some of those and approach them from the most general angle. But we'll start, we'll let it be in charge. We'll start by asking it for some exercises just on dynamic memory. I'm learning C programming and I want some practice with dynamic memory allocation. Uh, I really liked that breakdown it gave us last time, even though I misinterpreted some of it, where it did give me, at my request, one exercise involving some starter code. So I'm going to ask for that again. Um, can you create three programming exercises uh, that involve dynamic memory? where let's do where the third exercise. So last time I said where one of the exercises and then it, it, it generated stuff in a funny order where the third exercise um, includes some starter code, which is missing details that I can fill in. Don't show me the solution to any of the exercises. Okay, we'll see what it comes up with. Of course, here are three programming exercises that involve dynamic memory allocation. Um, all right, so here we are back with the books again. Um, this is the starter code it's generating. That looks good, and just to be clear, it looks like this starter code this time does go with exercise three. Okay, so I, I will, I'll do that when I get to exercise three. Um, all right, so uh, we have uh, exercise one, array resizing. Write a program that takes an initial array of integers and its size as input from the user. Then, uh, using dynamic memory allocation, create a new array that's twice the size of the original array. Copy the elements from the original array to the new array and free the memory occupied by the original array. Uh, I, have a, I have an issue with this. I'm going to talk about exercise two because my skim of exercise two sort of has the same issue. Exercise two, dynamic matrix. Create a program that allows the user to input the number of rows and columns for a matrix. Um, then use dynamic memory allocation to create a 2D array, that is to say a matrix, of integers with the specified dimensions. <laughs> Fill the matrix with random numbers and then print its contents. Uh, okay, don't forget to free the allocated memory when you're done. Uh, I'm going to call a mulligan on both of these, but I have to give you a good reason for that. I don't want to be rejecting them artificially, so I'm going to do exercise one and point out the issue that I have with this. All right, so I'll copy it. I'll head back over here and we'll paste this in. Uh, so uh, let's see. Write a program that takes an initial array of integers and its size as input from the user. So I interpret this to mean that it takes the size first, because obviously if I knew the array, I could figure out its size. If I know how many elements the user entered, then I know how many elements the user entered. So I'm going to interpret this to mean that I take the size first. Um, I'm going to write this program. I'm going to go pretty quickly because I want to illustrate that the way this is phrased, we don't need malloc and free to do this. Um, I, I don't understand, I mean, other than the fact that it says uh, use malloc and free. I'm going to write a version of this exercise that I believe is correct but doesn't use malloc and free. I don't really get the point of this creating a new array that's twice the size of the original array. This is one of, so ChatGPT sometimes makes these suggestions that are sort of I don't, scatterbrained or something. They don't really make any sense at all. This is reminding me of that time it tried to print a pyramid back in week two or whatever that was where the pyramid looked nothing like a pyramid. Sometimes its ideas just come completely uh, out of nowhere. I'm going to implement this without using malloc and free. 
Okay, so int size, I'm gonna ask the user to enter a size, enter a size, uh, and then I'll use scanf, I will do the error checking for scanf, um, so I'll use percent %d, uh, I'll ask it to read the result into size. Uh, if that is not equal to one, then I guess we're done. So I'll tell the user to go away. Printf, that is not a size, goodbye. Uh, okay, and then I exit from main. Uh, okay, otherwise, I'm just gonna make an array of that size. All right, so I create an array of the size that was provided, uh, and then I'll say uh, enter, that number of values. And I give it back the size. Uh, and now I'm going to use a loop just to read that number of values from the user. Now, this is something we've already done. I mean, we haven't written a version where we take the size in advance, but uh, we have written code that reads stuff from the user up to a certain limit. So i is equal to zero, i is less than size, i plus plus. Um, and then I'll just call scanf to read that. And I should add, this is also an example essentially that's in the lecture slot, in the lecture material. Uh, okay, so I read an integer into a sub i, and I want to do some error checking there. So I say, if scanf does not return one, I asked it for one thing, uh, then we've got a problem. I'm gonna tell the user to go away. Uh, there we go. So you didn't enter value, and then I just print whatever index. Um, you didn't enter element and then I give it the value of i, and then the program exits. Okay, so it then says create, it does say use dynamic memory allocation, that is use malloc, but I'm gonna write this without using malloc, uh, and I wanna make a point about that afterwards. Create a new array that's twice the size. I don't understand why I would want to do that. That makes no sense, but okay, here I go doing that, two times size. Um, and then it says copy the elements from the original array into the new array, which again, makes very little sense, I mean, it's one thing that I want a copy of an array, but why am I making the new array twice the size? But that's what it says. Um, okay, there's the copy. I just made the copy, and if you didn't believe me, why don't I print it out? Um, there's elements of B, uh, and then I'll just paste the loop and print out each element of B. And then when I'm done, I'll print a new line. Okay, now this is where it says um, free the memory used for B. I can't because I'm not using malloc, but I, 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 I've written this solution without using malloc. Let's take a look to see if it works. Practice memory one, enter a size, let's do three, and my, my values will be six, 10, and 17, and there are the elements of B. We'll try it again, I'll enter one value, it's just the value six. Um, I'll try it again, I'll enter six values, let's do six, 10, 17, 2023, 111, negative 116. Um, okay, and it prints them back out. So basically my issue with the exercise is we don't need malloc to do this. We can easily create arrays of any size we want. It's interesting that ChatGPT frames it the way it does. It frames it sort of like you need dynamic memory for this. I know that's not saying that explicitly, but it's carrying that implication. Um, it could be doing the same thing we did with pointer arithmetic, where it takes an exercise that you don't need pointer arithmetic for and just says, do this with pointer arithmetic. Maybe it's doing that. I don't want to do exercises like that because in practice as a C programmer, I would recommend that unless you need malloc and free, you shouldn't use malloc and free. They're important, they're really valuable, but they're really supposed to be used only if nothing else works. We like the normal way that memory is managed. We'd rather use that. One reason we'd rather use that is um, I allocated A and B using the normal convention for allocating arrays. I don't have to worry about freeing the memory because that's taken care of for me. That's done automatically. Okay, now, fine, I will do the exercise with malloc just to show off that it can be done with malloc. So to use malloc, I have to include standard lib.h. Standard lib.h is a sort of miscellaneous library header full of various things that don't fit in elsewhere. So we know already about string.h for string functions, math.h for math stuff, and ctype.h for character stuff, as well as the venerable stdio.h, which is standard io, which is used for things like printf and scanf. Standard lib.h is functions and def definitions that don't really fit easily elsewhere and don't deserve a header of their own. So malloc and free, because malloc and free are just two functions and that's it. Um, the exit function lives in standard lib.h. Uh, so I'll, I'll bring in standard lib.h and now uh, instead of allocating b to b, um, okay, hold on. 
Previously, I had B allocated like this, two times size as the number of elements. Now I'm going to allocate it as a, an array uh, that's dynamically allocated. So I use int star. I call malloc, and the, the space I want to allocate here will be, I would like um, two times size is the number of elements I want. And I also have to tell malloc, I, what malloc takes as an argument is the total number of bytes I want to allocate. So here's the number of elements I want to allocate, and the number of bytes would be the number of elements multiplied by the size of one element. So in this case, the size of an int, because it's an array of, of type int. Now, because I use malloc, I have to now make sure that at some point in my program, I use the free function to dispose of the memory that I allocated. All right, so we'll try running that. Enter a size. Let's do 6 again. 10, 6, 17, 1, 1, 1, 2023, negative 116. Okay, there it is. So I was able to implement the exercise with malloc, um, but that wasn't really that exciting. I mean, this really isn't an exercise that needs malloc, and I don't think we should spend much time on exercises like this. So I guess I did do exercise one after all. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm going to ask for a replacement anyway. So uh, we'll go back over to ChatGPT. Now, for what it's worth, the exercise two seems to me to be the same deal. Uh, it's true that using malloc to create 2D arrays is a lot more complicated. Um, depending on what it means by this, this could be a much more challenging exercise if we insist on using malloc. Uh, we'd have to use uh, some casts or other weird type shenanigans that we don't normally use in this course. On the other hand, what's being described here, filling the matrix with random numbers and printing it out, you could do that by just making an array the way we did without malloc. We could just ask the user for the dimensions and then make an array of that size. We don't need malloc to do this. So I'm going to ask it for a replacement for exercises one and two. If you want to know a way of doing this without by using malloc, so try doing this yourself with without malloc if you're interested. If you then want to know how to do it with malloc, you do need a little bit more, I don't know, syntactic gymnastics. You're welcome to give that a try. The way of allocating 2D arrays with malloc is not something we're going to care about in this course. But if you really want to know about it, I'm happy to go through with you. Just come to the office hours or something. It, 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 I don't think the exercise done with malloc makes much sense in our context because we can do it without malloc. And because with malloc, it's not really an, a malloc exercise. It's mostly a fighting with types exercise. Um, I don't, I'm just going to say I don't like them. I don't like exercises one and two. Can you generate replacements? And if the replacements don't make sense, then I'll ask it something more specific. Um, I forgot to say not to give me the solution. Um, okay, so I can already see a problem with this new exercise one. Exercise one, linked list. Well, linked lists are great. I love linked lists. You're going to hear a lot more from me about linked lists in what? Like the next video or next week's videos because that's our next topic. But because it's our next topic, I'm not going to do it in this video. So we're not going to do exercise one. Um, I don't know about linked lists yet. I don't want to use linked lists today, because if I just say I don't know about it, it'll try and teach me about it. Um, can you replace exercise one again? Of course, let's replace exercise one with a different memory allocation exercise. Okay, that's weird. It also replaced exercise two. I guess I'll choose from among the exercises I now have uh, and um, uh, just choose two of them. Okay, exercise one, dynamic string reversal. Okay, string reversal again. Write a program that reads a string from the user. Use dynamic memory allocation to create a new string that's the reverse of the input string. Okay, sure. Let, let, we can do that. Um, the other choices are exercise two, dynamic string concatenation. So this is strcat, basically, uh, S-T-R-C-A-T. Create a program that reads two input strings from the user, then use dynamic memory allocation to concatenate the two strings together. This is something that doesn't seem to need malloc, because if I'm already reading the strings from the user, then I would know their length, and then I could just create a new string myself as an array. So this is less interesting than, hopefully, this other exercise. Dynamic array of structures. Create a program to manage a collection of students' information using dynamic memory allocation. Define a structure to hold student details such as name, age, and grade. Allow the user to input the number of students and then dynamically allocate memory for an array of structures. Read the details for each student and store them in the array. 
Finally, print out the details of all the students and free the allocated memory. Now, if you stare at this, there's a kernel in here that does seem like something we haven't done yet. This, this idea that maybe we could make it so the student's name can be any length. The way that this is framed, though, doesn't seem like that's the point of the exercise. And I could try doing the exercise with that as the main conceit, but it would be a huge amount of time just to get to that point, because it's looking like it's asking me just to do the same thing we've already done a couple of times, but it's saying dynamic memory allocation, when really what it means is you're making an array whose size you don't know in advance. So actually, I'm, I've got half a mind to reject both of these. Dynamic concatenation, because we could do this already, we don't need malloc for it, and dynamic array of structures. You can use malloc for these. I just really want an exercise that shows off why you need malloc, not just gives you an excuse to use malloc. And I already did one exercise that gave me an excuse to use malloc. Okay, before I get all grouchy about that, let's do the exercise that I am willing to put up with, dynamic string reversal. All right. So I'll head back over here. I'm going to make this my new exercise one because I feel like this is a little bit more exercise, uh, a memory exercise than the previous example was. Use dynamic memory allocation to create a new string that is the reverse of the input string. So it just says read string input from the user. Um, and we could interpret this in a variety of ways. And I'm going to try and turn this into the most dynamic memory e exercise as I possibly can over a couple of variations. And in so doing, I hope that I can prove that I don't need to do those two other exercises it suggested, and I can ask for a more interesting replacement. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read the input from the user into a regular char array. So in this case, um, notice, notice that this string can be at most 100 characters long. Okay, so I'll ask the user to enter a string, enter a string. All right, uh, and then I'm going to read the string from the user somehow. Um, I guess for now I'll use scanf. So uh, maybe I want to change this later so that I don't use scanf, because if I use scanf, then the string the user enters has to be only one word long. Like if the user enters a space, scanf will stop. But I'm planning on doing a couple of variations. So I'll start with scanf just as a way of bootstrapping my way into something I can test. Um, okay, so now I'll now print you entered, and then I'll print out the string that was entered, um, and then that's input. And now I'm going to reverse the string. So the way the exercise is written, if I do everything in main, I do not need dynamic memory. So I could just make a new string called reversed, which has size 10. I mean, obviously, like there's no problem there. I, I already know that input will be at most this length, and so will reverse. So who cares? I could use malloc, but there's no point. So I thought of a variant of the exercise that does satisfy all the criteria, but will make it so that I need to use malloc. And it works like this. So I'm going to make a function to reverse my string. Uh, the difference is, unlike our previous string exercises, this function is not going to modify the string you provide. So I'm going to call it reverse. It's going to take as input some input string. But I'm going to make it so the input string is constant. That is, I can't change it. Um, and we've done a string reversal exercise already that works like this. What we did was we took the output um, string as a second argument. And then we just copy characters from here into here and produce the reversal. And for what it's worth, that is probably the best way to implement string reversal. Um, however, I'm going to try a different technique. I'm going to make it so that the function doesn't take the result array and it's not allowed to modify the input array. Instead, the function is going to return a string. And it does this by returning something of type char star. We already know that I'm not allowed to um, return an array like this. If I create this array inside the function, the array will be destroyed when the function ends. I'm not allowed to return it. Or I mean, I can try returning it, but something bad will happen. Um, in fact, the compiler will probably tell me that something bad will happen. Let's try compiling this. It says, warning, be careful, this function returns the address of a local variable. And in a separate video, and in the lectures by now, I've mentioned this, if you do this, the program will almost certainly crash, or something bad will happen. So we can't do that. I'm not allowed to return a pointer into an array that I create inside the scope, because the array gets destroyed with the scope. So what do I do? How can I return an array um, if the arrays I create with the normal notation get destroyed? Well, here, finally, Finally, we actually need malloc. If I allocate the array with malloc, it doesn't get destroyed until I destroy it myself. And so I can create the array inside the function and return it. Um, okay, but to do that, I first have to know how big the array is going to be. 
And what I'm doing here is writing the most general version of a string reversal function. This will give you uh, the reversed version of a string no matter how long the string is, as long as there's enough memory available. So what I'll do is I'll get the length of the input string, so that would be str len, so uh, of my input string. Then I'm going to create an array, of my, my result array, to store the reversed string. I'm going to do that with malloc. So I call malloc, I tell it the size, the number of elements. Now the number of elements in my new string is going to be length plus one. So enough elements to store all the characters in my input string plus the null terminator. So length plus one um, multiplied by the size of an element of my array. So that, this is the typical malloc invocation. Number of elements multiplied by size of one element. So connoisseurs that are watching this might observe that, as far as they're concerned, this term isn't necessary. If you print out size of char on your machine, odds are it's one. And therefore, I could just write this. And you'll often see in C code other people have written that works with strings, you'll see that when they allocate a string with malloc, they do not put size of char. But I do. I think it's a great idea. First, it builds a good habit. You should always put a size of term in malloc because then you'll never forget to do it. If you do it every time, there won't be a case where you forget as long as you build that habit. Second, we want to write flexible, maintainable code. It is pretty much true that for all eternity from now on, size of char is going to be one. But on the other hand, just in case it ever isn't, uh, and just in case you're working in a different context one of these days, or maybe you're making strings of a non-char type, and that's a weird thing to think about, it's good to build this habit. And you know what? If you're worried about, oh, I'm multiplying by one, that's a waste of time. Whose time? Your time? Because if you write this, if you get into the habit of writing it, it doesn't take really any extra time at all. It makes the code easier to debug. It makes it easier to understand. It's much more obvious to somebody looking at this that you're allocating an array of char. If you're worried about the computer's time, then don't. If the compiler knows that this is a multiplication by one, the compiler will automatically get rid of it for you when it compiles. So there's no harm in adding the size of char term here. All right, I've made my result array, and now I just need to copy my reversed string in. So I'm gonna do this, uh, I'll draw my usual string diagram here. So here's my string. So H, E, this is a bit of a poorly laid out string. Try it again. Um, Okay, there we go, H, E, L, L, O, null terminator. I've got my result string that I've just created. It's going to be of the right size. The way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna use two index variables. I could do this with only one index variable. I could also do some weird pointer arithmetic shenanigans, but I'm gonna use two index variables because it's easy to debug. I'm gonna have one index variable pointing uh, into the original string and it's gonna to move to the right. I'm gonna have another index variable pointing to the new string. I'm gonna pre-install that null terminator and then I'm going to have this index variable move to the left. So at each step, I walk forwards by one. So I add one to my index into my input string. I subtract one from my index into my other string. Uh, okay, so I'll do in idx equals zero, uh, int out idx equals, well, okay, so that would be length minus one. While I'm at it, I will also add the null terminator to um, the result string. So as usual, the length of a string also happens to be the location, the index of the null terminator. So I can just go, I know exactly where it's going to be because when I reverse a string, I don't change its length. All right, now I'll write the loop. Uh, the loop will be, uh, I guess I could even actually use a, a for loop that just iterates up to length here, but I'm used to, I've got this one string reverse algorithm stuck in my brain forever. So while um, input at index in idx is not equal to, uh, the null terminator, then I'm going to keep moving, and at each step, what I'll do is I will, uh, into result at index out idx, I will copy input at index in idx, and then I'll move the uh, in idx forward and the out idx backwards. Uh, and then when I'm done, I will return my result string. Notice that I call malloc, I do not call free. Because I've created the array inside the function, whoever receives it from me, it's gonna be their responsibility to destroy the array. Uh, okay, so I'll now try and call the function. So I'll, it'll be char star reversed um, equals, and I'll call my reverse function give it the input string. Uh, and then when I'm done, I'll have to, I guess I want to print it out first. So um, reversal is, and then this will line up nicely. Uh, and so I'll print out the reversal. And then I have to free that reversed. Notice that I do not call free on input because input wasn't allocated with malloc. You only call free on things that were allocated with malloc. 
All right, so we'll we'll try compiling this. It looks like it worked. We'll try running it. Okay, enter a string. Hello, I'll do hello world with no space, and it looks like it reverses correctly. I'll try another example, just the word hello. Looks like it works. I'll try the letter H. Looks like it works. Now, if I enter a space, remember, I'm using scanf to read my string. And so scanf only can read up to the first space. Then it's going to stop. Uh, I want to go through a progression of enhancements to this. I want to try and turn this into as much of a malloc exercise as possible, with the ground rules, though, being that I shouldn't use malloc unless I need to, unless I have no other choice. You can, but I don't think you should. There are cases where you need malloc even for arrays you could potentially allocate this way. So if they get really big, for example, you might need malloc. But here, the way it's currently written, I do not need malloc if I know that my input string will be at most 100 characters. I want to build up to a point where I can make my input string literally as big as possible. Um, but before I do that, I want to change how I get my input. Instead of using scanf, I'm going to read the input manually using getchar. I could also use fgets for this, but I, I'm going to use getchar um, because I, I basically what I'm going to do next is easier if I do the getchar version. So what I'll do is I'll say int i equals zero. This is the current index into my string. And then I'm going to call and I'll grab the current character int ch equals getchar. And then I'm going to keep reading characters from the user until they enter a new line. So this way they can enter spaces. That solves the immediate problem of scanf not reading spaces. Um, what I'll do at each step is I'll install into my input array the character I just read, and then I'll just grab another character from the user. That looks all good. And then when I'm done, I'll add the null terminator to input. Now, I should be careful because obviously the size of the array is limited, and I need to make sure that i is, uh, whoops, and i is less than, um, 100. So when i equals 100, 100 is the last valid index into this size of array, I need to use that null terminator. So i cannot be allowed to equal 100 inside of this loop. So I have to add that bounds checking there because otherwise I'm in for a bad time later. Uh, I'm going to try running this. I'll first try hello again. Uh, oops. Okay. So let's take a look. Um, it says I entered blank. Reversal is blank. Okay. But it did read my input. Uh, I'm noticing there is a bug. The bug is, and I'm. this is just blind luck that I'm able to figure this out. I just happened to hit upon it. But it looks like my value of i isn't being incremented. So I'll remember to do that. i plus plus. And hopefully that's the only bug. Okay. I type hello. Okay. That works. I type hello world with a space. And that works. Um, I type a bunch of junk. And this is less than 100 characters. Yep, that works. Um, let's see what happens if I generate an input of longer than 100 characters. So OK, here's an input. Um, there's a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, j. That should be 10 characters. Um, OK, so I'll do this uh, ten more, nine more times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then at the, after the last one, I'll put uh, X, Y, Z. Okay. So this construction here is 103 characters in length. So I'll copy it. I will try pasting it into my program. Um, it didn't paste. Oh, there he goes. Okay. Um, and if I look at it, I notice that the string gets cut off. It stops after this J here because the X, Y, Z are over the 100 character limit. Now, it's pretty easy to fix that. I could just make the limit larger. So I could make it 1,000 instead of 100. And I'll just prove that that works. So paste it in again, and it does. Okay, great. The problem is, no matter how big I make the limit, the limit is static. It's fixed. So the user could give me a string that's a little bit too long. So for the sake of argument, let's try making the length 10. Well, if I do that, I'll make the string have the, the maximum length is 10, so the array has size 11. Well, if I do that, then obviously the string is going to get cut off pretty early. And no matter where I set the limit, there will be somebody that enters a string that gets cut off because you know they could enter a string larger than whatever limit you set. And even if you make the limit ridiculously large, hoping that nobody will make a string that big, even that's not a great idea because if you make the string have size like 10 million, then aren't you wasting most of that space? I mean, that is a point where we're consuming more resources resources than we need. If most people's strings are five characters long, why are you making an array of size 10 million? So as, as another way of turning this into a real malloc exercise, I want to make it so I can read as many characters as the user enters, with no limit except, of course, if the computer runs out of memory. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use an array that I allocate with malloc, and if, I, if it gets full, then I'll make a new array. So I'm going to begin with an array, let's say, of size 5. 
Okay, so uh, suppose the user enters characters and I end up needing all five positions in my array. If that happens, I'll make a new array that's let's say size 10, copy everything into it. I'll use string copy for that. Uh, and then I'll just start working on the remaining positions in that array. And I'll keep resizing the array, although I'm not actually resizing anything. What I'm doing is pretending as if this new array is the same as my old array. I'm just gonna swap them. Uh, and this will allow the array to get as big as I want and also give me a good excuse to use malloc again. So here, I'm not gonna make my fixed size array. Instead, I'm gonna say int max size equals five. And then at each step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allocate an array. Every time I resize the array, I'm going to increase max size. Um, and if ever the index reaches max size, then I'm going to make the array a little bit bigger. So I'll do char star uh, input equals, I'm going to use malloc to create the array the first time. And that's going to be max, si well, actually max size plus one. I won't include the null terminator in the max size. I'm going to rename this to max length to make it clear to me that it's the length of the string. So max length equals five, max length plus one allows for a space for the null terminator times size of char. Okay, so then what I'm gonna do is malloc has returned this. Now, one thing I haven't done yet in this video that we generally don't do in this course, but is significant in future courses is malloc has the right to return null. It could say, I'm sorry, I don't have any memory for you and give you nothing. In this course, we don't worry too much about that because usually if that happens, you know, it's over anyway, we can't do anything. But that is the kind of thing that for an error resilient program, you would want to check. But I'm gonna continue our pattern of not checking that uh, in this context. So I allocate the array. So as of this line, we're going to assume we do have an array to work with. I then fill this in uh, just like I was before, except I no longer want this. So I don't wanna stop the loop if I hit the maximum size. And instead, I wanna say, you know, if you're trying to add a character, so if i is equal to max size or max length. So if max length equals five, the array has space for one more thing. So if i equals max length, there's still space to cram in an null terminator. But if i equals max length and I'm on line 41, I need space to add a new character. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add, I'm just gonna increase max length. So max length, um, let's do, we'll add five to it. Um, in practice, just a note on the side, in practice, you actually generally are better off if you resize arrays to double the size at each step. That tends to be faster in the long run up to a certain point. But here, whatever, we'll just resize it by adding five more positions. And then I'm going to play a little game where um, currently input is just a pointer. It points to this array allocated out in the wilderness by malloc. Um, and so I should actually draw that. Input is of type char star. So it's not an array, it's a pointer. What I'm gonna do is make a new array down here. I'm gonna fill it with all the same stuff as the old array, and then I'm gonna set input to point to this. So after I'm done that, you won't be able to, you wouldn't even know that I've started using a new array. As far as you're concerned, input now points to a longer array. It doesn't make any difference exactly how I made that work. Um, okay, so what I'll do is I'll say char star new input equals malloc, and I'll make an array of the larger size. So max length plus one. Um, times size of char. So ma I'm still doing max length plus one because I've changed max length. Um, and then I'm gonna copy everything from the old array to the new array. Now to do this, I sort of wanna use string copy. The problem is that my string input isn't currently null terminated. So I've got a couple of options. I could write a loop to do the copy myself, or I could just add a um, null terminator to the end of the string to make it a string. So remember that at every step, i is the index of the next available space. I want to, so I've got this string. So I'm in this situation here. Um, the i points to this position. You've just given me a new character that I want to store into the string, but the string is about to be full. There's only one position left. It's reserved for the null terminator. So my solution on line 42 is put a null terminator there, then make a new array, a longer one, copy everything in with string copy, and then pick it up from there. So now that I can do that, I've got, I'm gonna bring in string.8. Oh, it's already there. I already did this. Um, string copy into my new input array, copy whatever was in the old input array, and then uh, I want to free the old input array. So this is something where we need to use a diagram or everything's gonna get messed up. So input currently points to this array here. I also have this array that I've created with a different name called new input, and it's this. 
Okay, I've already copied all of the contents of input array into new input. There they are. Um, and I still points to this position of both arrays. Uh, and so I'm going to overwrite this null terminator with something else in a minute. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm now done with this array forever. So I'm going to call free on this. And then I'm going to redirect the pointer input to point to the new array. The reason that having a diagram is so important here is that if I'm freeing something, I run the risk of losing something I still need. So having a diagram helps me verify that I'm not getting rid of data that I need. So input equals new input. They both now are pointers to the same thing. All right, so I all, I've, I've free everything that I malloc. So the first input array gets freed down here. The new input array gets allocated here. And then when the loop is over, ideally, I should have a, full, a fully formed string in this array called input. But of course, the array that this refers to was allocated via malloc. So I need to make sure I free it when I'm done. So I'm going to free it at the very end of the program. If you're worried about this, one simple way to verify that you're freeing everything that you malloc or to give you some assurances is every time you uh, malloc something, put a print statement right afterwards that prints out malloc. And then every time you free, print out free and verify that the number of times you see each thing is equal. That's one way, one basic test that helps you give, get some peace of mind. There are much more advanced ways of doing it. There are entire programming environments or debugging tools. So for example, you could look up a tool called Valgrind that is used that, that can be used to actually track memory leaks and make sure you're freeing everything. Everything. But we, we're not going to do that. We're going to just trust ourselves here. Okay, so practice memory one. Okay, so under a string, there's a string hello. It looks like it reverses. Here's the string hello world. Looks like it, it picks it up. Even though the original size of the string is five, um, it does seem to be able to take strings of size 10. Um, let's see. I, I think I still have that long string copied from earlier. Uh, nope, I don't. Okay, well, I'll go recreate it. So I'll just do hello world over and over again. So there's hello world, that's 10 characters, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. There's x, y, z, just to mark off that I'm at position 100. Um, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, a. So that's 10 more characters. And then, uh, so this is now a 110 character string. So I'll copy it, I'll paste that in, and it looks like it's all there. I have the whole string. Uh, let's see how far I can make this go. So I'm gonna paste this in a bunch of times. Now, obviously, I still should verify that it's the right bunch of times. At the end of it, I'll put three Zs just to make it, or a bunch of Zs. Um, okay, so the program generates a bunch of output. It looks disgusting. Uh, we'll just scroll up through it until I see something that makes sense. Uh, okay, so I enter the string. Okay, I scroll down. At some point, it's going to print out the reversal. It's going to be buried in all this junk. Uh, there's the reversal. Reversal is, there are all my Zs, and then this huge long string. It looks like this is now able to read strings of any length, and I've used malloc to help actuate that. And this is something I need malloc for. I can make arrays of any size I want, even if I don't know the size in advance. That's why the exercises ChatGPT originally suggested didn't quite give me a reason to use malloc. However, one thing I can't do is resize an array. Once I've created the array, I can't change its size. With malloc, I still can't resize an array, but I can play this little shell game where I make a new array and then have the new array impersonate the old array to give the appearance of resizing it, uh, which is close enough because for use, for the sake of actually using the array, you get the same, um, you get the same functionality. Okay, so there is my revised exercise one. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to not do exercise two on the grounds that exercise two appears to be mostly allocate an array of any length of structure objects. But we already know we can allocate arrays of structure objects without malloc. Um, I could use a similar trick to what I just did to allow the student's name to be any length. Uh, and I could read the student's name using getchar, for example. Um, I, I, I could try that. It seems like that's a lot of exercise to do just to prove that one point, given that I already wrote the, the, the code to do that. Um, okay, and then I've got dynamic string concatenation. Now, from my money, again, this seems like I don't need malloc. And if I do need malloc, it'll be very similar to what I just did. So I could have a function that does concatenation or something. Um, but let's ask it for a replacement. I, I don't like those either. Please generate two more replacements. Of course, uh, apologies, whatever. 
dynamic integer sorting sentence word reversal. Now I'm doing exercise, I'm going to be doing the second exercise of the video. I want to eventually get around to exercise three with the starter code, so I'm going to choose one of these. Um, write a program that allows the user to enter a list of integers. Use dynamic memory allocation to create an array to store these integers. After reading them, sort them in ascending order using any sorting algorithm of your choice. And I know a few of them. I, these, these two are both examples of that print the sorted integers, and then free the memory. Okay, I interpret this to be allow the user to enter as many numbers as they want. So we would use a similar logic to what we just did with getchar uh, and malloc to allow the users, the array the user enters to be as big as they want it to be, even if we don't know the size in advance. Um, so this is in some ways similar to what we just did. Exercise two, my other option is create a program that reads a sentence, a sentence being a string with multiple words from the user. Use dynamic memory allocation to reverse the order of the words in the sentence. Uh, okay, I, I don't see how I need dynamic memory for that. I mean, if I can get the words into a string, I could get the words into small arrays and then, yeah. So I, I'm gonna, this is a neat exercise, but it's not really a dynamic, I, I don't think ChatGPT knows what I want here. So I'm gonna do this, exor this, this new exercise one. That's gonna be the thing I do as my second exercise for today. Um, I'm gonna have to, give a brief explanation of what's happening at this point when I get there, but I'll first go over and start writing my code. So uh, I'll paste in the exercise. There it is. Um, and as I mentioned, this is very similar to what we just did. I'm going to read integers from the user until they're done. And so what I want is the ability to store as many numbers as the user enters. Now, one way of doing this is using something called a linked list, which I mentioned earlier we haven't covered yet, so I'm not going to do that. Another way of doing this, one that does use dynamic memory allocation, is to do what we just did in exercise one, where I create an array and I keep resizing it to make it big enough for the number of things that I need. And I think I could just copy and paste my code from exercise one, but it's code for strings and it might be more trouble than it's worth. Okay, so I'm gonna say enter a bunch of integers. Um, enter a bunch of numbers. Uh, no, that's not very, okay. Enter a list of integers. Uh, and how do I know when the user is done? Um, when you are done, enter a non-numeric value. Okay, because scanf has a way of detecting when I enter a non-numeric value. Um, all right. So now what I'll do is I'll just mock up the loop that I want. So I'm going to write a loop that looks like this. Basically, I'm going to ask scanf to read a value. I'm going to put the value in a variable n, and the loop is going to keep going until scanf fails. So until the user enters something that isn't a number or they signal end of file, then scanf keeps going. So I'm leveraging the fact that scanf can detect whether I entered a number or not. What I need to do, though, is store the value n in an array. Okay, how do I do that? Well. Obviously, I don't know in advance how big the array is going to be. So I'm going to do basically the same thing I just did, except not with a character array, but with an integer array. So I'm going to call the array, uh, we'll call it a. Int star a equals, well, let's start with, a, we'll, we'll keep a variable max size. Max size equals, we'll start it at five. Um, and then I want to have a second variable for the actual size. And we're going to call this variable actually, like it'll be named size. So I've got size and I've got max size. Maybe we'll call it capacity instead of max size, just so we don't have the word size floating around in two different places. So capacity is the number of elements I can accommodate at most. Size is the number of things that are actually there. So I start by using malloc to allocate an array of capacity, that's the number of elements, times the size of an element, size of int. See how nice it is to build that habit of always putting a size of uh, invocation inside of the call to malloc? Uh, and then size equals zero. And so at each step, what I'll do is I'll say a at index size, so I'm adding a new element, equals n size plus plus. So size, just like with a string, size is going to refer to um, the next available index of the array, which means at, it also refers to the number of elements that I'm storing. Now, if I get to a point, though, where the index size does not exist, so for example, if size is equal to capacity, so if the array has capacity 10, if it's an array of 10 elements and size equals 10, then 10 is not a valid index. So I've got to make a replacement array. So I'll do that just like we did before. I'll say capacity plus equals five. Um, int star new a equals malloc. I'll make a new array that's a little bit bigger. So capacity times size of int. And now I'm going to copy everything over. 
Um, I might as well just write a loop for that. So uh, for int i equals zero, i is less than the current size, i plus plus, copy everything into my new array. So new a sub i equals a sub i, just copy all the elements over. And then I free my old array a, and I set a to refer to my new array a. So just to skim over that, this is the same process I did in the string code. Oh, and then at the very bottom, before I forget, I'm gonna free the array a once and for all. So if A is currently pointing to, I should draw it like a pointer, if A is currently pointing to this array here, um, I don't know, how about this? Okay, 6, 10, 17, 111, 116. What I'll do is if, if I notice, so at this point, size equals five. And if I just got a new element, I have to store that in index five, but there is no index five. So I make a new array, I'll call it new A. And it is going to, after the malloc call is done, it's going to point to an array of size, I guess, 10, but definitely a larger size. So then I copy every element over. That would be this loop here, 6, 10, 17, 111, 116. The size value refers now to this index. There are five elements in the array, and so this is index five, the next available index. Notice that it is an index and it is available. I then free the old array A because it's now useless. That's this line here. And then I set the pointer A to actually point to this new array. So once I'm done the curly brackets, nobody can tell the difference. The, the, the variable new A gets destroyed when the scope uh, uh, ends. And so as far as anybody's concerned, A has always been this array that has a bunch of extra space at the end. All right. And so then I set, uh, I add the element to the array. And then I guess down here, I'll just print that out. So you entered and then we'll print. So for I equals zero, I is less than the size of the array, I plus plus. Um, and I'll print out the value of the element at index I. And then when I'm done, I'll print a new line. There we go. And we'll try running this. Um, so practice memory two is this exercise. There we go, we'll try running it. Okay, uh, whoops, practice memory two. Enter a list of integers. When I'm done, enter a non-numeric value. So I'll do six, then 10, then 17, then I'll type the word done. That's not a number. And I, it says, you entered, uh, and then it stops and it prints out nothing. Ooh. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of debugging there. Um, okay, so the question then is what went wrong? So I'm trying to print out a sub i, and if I work backwards from that, I, I say, okay, well, I am trying to put stuff in the array a. Um, I did enter some stuff. I am using scanf, I think, to read numbers. So what could have gone wrong here? Um, the way that I would reverse engineer this is, I'll just put more print statements to try and figure out where something went wrong. Um, so actually one more test I'll do is, if I just type six and press enter, it stops immediately. Okay, that's sort of interesting. So notice how here I didn't enter a non-numeric value and it did still quit on me. So that's something else I should take into account. Um, okay, so to do that, to, to sort of work backwards from this, um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna print out as I read each value. And I think at this point, it's not actually re reading anything, but okay, so I, I'm just gonna print each value that I read. There we go. And I'll try running the program again to debug. Okay, so enter a list of integers, 6, 10, 17, type the word done, you entered. So this print statement never ran. And that's a sign that apparently this loop isn't working properly. Okay, so now of course I have to begin questioning all the decisions that I've ever made. So one thing I will do next is I will try calling scanf just by itself. I'll see whether maybe I've made a mistake in my use of scanf. Um, and we saw in a previous video, I basically did do that. So we'll try doing this and then print out the value of n is, and then I print out n. Okay, so we'll try running that. Um, okay, so I, I type six. The value of n is six. Okay, that looks a little bit weird. So what's going on here? It looks like my call to scanf worked properly. So when I entered a number, scanf did read the number. And the way that I converge on this, I think I see the bug now. So thank you for bearing with me. The way I converged on this was first, I added more print statements to figure out where the bug was occurring. So I put a print statement in the loop and the print statement never ran. I then looked at the loop condition and said, there must be something wrong with this loop condition. Um, but I don't know what it is. Maybe I wrote my call to scanf incorrectly. So I tried taking the call to scanf and using it outside the loop and it worked. And that's a sign to me that the problem isn't the scanf call, it's something else about the loop. So what does the loop condition mean? While scanf doesn't return one, 
Okay, but wait a minute. What does it mean for scanf to return 1? If scanf reads a number correctly, then it returns 1. I want to keep reading numbers as long as scanf can continue. So actually, I think this is my bug. I should have written equals instead of not equals there. And hopefully you saw my debugging process is, is no more precise than maybe yours was. I, I just had to be scientific. I had to try a bunch of stuff until I noticed it because missing an operator is a really hard bug to spot. Now, I suspect the reason why I wrote it this this way was because I keep writing these this, these um, uh, programs that use scanf with error checking. I think I did that. I did that in the last video. I did that earlier in the exercise that we ended up not using, where I keep writing if statements that look like this. And so I guess by muscle memory, I wrote not equals. So we'll try it again with two equal signs. I'm going to leave in my debugging statement because I want to fix the bug before I go any further. All right, so enter 6, 10, 17, and done. It says, I read 6, I read 10, I read 17. You entered 6, 10, 17. Okay, I think I fixed that bug, so I'll, I'll remove my debugging statement. I'm going to try it one more time on a different array to make sure I can enter arrays of apparently lots of different sizes. 6, 10, 17, 111, 2023, negative 116, 187, and then I guess I'm a 445, 485. I'm out of ideas now. Uh, I type in something non-numeric like the word done, and it does seem to read all of them. Okay, so I think I'm able to use malloc to read this large array of integers. Now, the next part of the problem is, after reading them, sort them into ascending order. Now, this isn't actually a dynamic memory exercise. This is just an exercise in working with arrays. But okay, why not? Let's do that. Um, so it doesn't ex give me any requirements for how I do the sorting. It even says I can use a sorting algorithm of my choice. So any sorting algorithm that I want. It names two sorting algorithms. If you want to know about bubble sort or insertion sort, you can either ask Wikipedia or you could ask ChatGPT to... Actually, maybe I should. I'll ask ChatGPT to tell me. Um, can you describe bubble sort? So bubble sort it works by swapping adjacent elements, but we'll see whether this whether ChatGPT gives a useful description. I think it does. I think ChatGPT is very good at describing algorithms. Um, and so if you wanted to know how to sort things with bubbles, okay, um, you could ask it and it would. it's not letting me scroll up. So I'll just wait for this. It actually gives you a description of how the algorithm works. So start with an unsorted list, compare the elements and so on. Um, it then describes something about the time complexity, which is a more advanced topic than we cover in this course, and gives you sort of pseudocode. So this isn't C code, it's, it's sort of, um, language neutral code that's easy to read. Um, you could also ask it what insertion sort is. So what is insertion sort? Uh, and insertion, it's going to give you instructions for that as well. I'm going to let it tick away. I actually don't want to use either of these two algorithms. So uh, if I were to choose one of them, I, I don't like this one for a bunch of different reasons. It's a relatively simple algorithm, but I don't like it very much. Uh, insertion sort is pretty good. Insertion sort is the algorithm that it appears humans tend to use if you ask them to sort physical things. So if I hand you a deck of cards and I say, could you sort this deck of cards? Probably you would use an algorithm that's equivalent to insertion sort. So I'll give a brief explanation of that. Um, so suppose here is your set of numbers. Uh, let's do, I'm going to put a large number at the beginning. So you're given this list of numbers here, and you're told sort them. What you might do is you might take each number and you might build up your sorted array from left to right. So you'd start with the number on the left, and at each step you grab the next number and you put it in your sorted array wherever the sorted array, wherever the array would stay sorted. So at the beginning, the sorted array only has one thing in it, and you can see it's currently in sorted order. When I get to the next thing, the 10, okay, I have to move over the value 111 so that I can make room for the 10 to keep everything in sorted order. When I get to the 6, I have to move both things over, so the 111 goes here, the 10 goes here, to make room for the 6. And when I get to the 17, I have to move this over to make room for the 17. Okay, so, whoops. That's how you do insertion sort. The reason it's called insertion sort is you can think of what you do at each step as, so let's suppose there was one more thing in there. Um, let's have it be uh, 18. So what you think of what you're doing at each step, what you could think of it as is you take the next element and you find the position to insert it, to jam it in to wherever the, the array remains sorted. That's called insertion sort. That's a good algorithm. Uh, it's pretty, I like it. Uh, I'm going to use a different algorithm because in my head, the way I like doing sorting is an algorithm that isn't one of these two. There are even more advanced sorting algorithms that are faster, that take less time, that you'd cover in some second year course, but we don't need to do that today. I'm going to write a function called sort. 
and it takes an array called, so int a, um, and it's going to sort the array in place. So sort of a. Uh, sort the elements of a in place. Um, and so in place, as we know from previous videos, means that I am just modifying the contents of A. Now here is the sorting algorithm I want to use. It is going to be called selection sort. And if you look up sorting algorithms on Wikipedia, it will tell you, I think Wikipedia still has this, I'll go check on my other screen in fact, Wikipedia still has a wonderful list of sorting algorithms that talks about all sorts of uh, benefits and advantages of using um, one algorithm over another and reasons why some algorithms are simpler. So we'll take a look. The page called sorting algorithm has, uh, if I scroll down, this nice long table of different sorting algorithms and describes their properties. The one I think is a good simple algorithm for the sake of a course like this is called selection sort. The idea behind selection sort, let's get our array again. So there's 111, there's 6, there's 17, there's 10, there's 116. So I've got my array. It's already formed. It's been provided to me. Um, oh, speaking of that, I have, to, I have to know the size of the array. So I'll provide the size as an extra argument. Um, I will put the size in the square brackets so anybody looking knows that the point of the parameter size is to be the size of the array A. So here's an array of size 5. Here is how I will do selection sort. I'm going to start at the very beginning of the array and I'm going to work my way to the right. And at each step, so as, as I look at a specific element, I'm going to arrange it so that all of the elements up to and including the element I'm looking at are in sorted order. Uh, and the way I'll do that is I'll, I'll basically start at the beginning and ask the question, what element should go here in general? Even if the array goes way off at the end, uh, what element goes at the beginning? Well, the smallest element. So I'll go through the array and find the smallest element. And then I'll move that element to the front. I'll take whatever element that was left behind. So I have this value 111 that I had to kick out. I'll just put that wherever I found the smallest element. And you'll notice, now that I'm done at step one, the array is sorted up to the end of the first element. Okay, so now what's step two? So I move over to step two. And I say, now I want to find the element that goes here. Um, I, and at each step, I ignore all the elements before me because they're all going to be smaller elements than what I'm working with. So what element goes here? Well, it'll be the smallest thing among whatever's left over. So I go find that. It's going to be, in this case, it'll be this thing here. So I go and bring the number 10 to be at the current index. And then I swap it. So I just, I just take the element that got kicked out and put it there. Uh, and then you can see when I'm done at step two, the array is sorted up to the end of the second element. Okay, I look at step three. I go find the smallest element in the rest of the array. But in this case, it turns out it's just 17, so I do nothing. You could think of that sort of like swapping 17 with itself. Um, and, then, and then I get here, and then the same thing happens. So if the array is sorted up to this point, obviously 111 is smaller than 116. Um, suppose that it weren't, so suppose that this were 187. What I would do is find the smallest element that I have to the right of the current element, and that would be 116, and then I swap them and then the 187 goes here. That's called selection sort. A few people I've, I've heard of call this max sort. Um, let's see whether ChatGPT can tell me what selection sort is. So uh, what is selection sort? I'm gonna go take a look. Selection sort is a simple algorithm. Let's see if it gives a similar description to what I gave. Um, it's gonna give this pseudocode, which I don't really need. Um, and so here's, a, here's how the selection sort algorithm works. Number one, find the smallest element in the unsorted portion of the array. So as I said, uh, I work on the model that at each step, I look at a particular position in the array and I assume that everything up to that position has already been sorted. So that, that's the sorted portion. This is the unsorted portion. Find the smallest element in the unsorted portion. Um, swap this element with the element at the beginning of the unsorted portion. So if this is the smallest element in the unsorted portion, then I will swap it with whatever's at the beginning of the unsorted portion because this is the this what is this is the element that's supposed to come next in the sorted representation. And then I move the boundary over by one to the right. So now this is the sorted portion, everything up to this point. And then I repeat until the whole array is sorted, or in other words, until I get to the end of the array. So that's ChatGPT's explanation. So if you need it to help you, if it gives an exercise that involves an algorithm, you can always ask it what the algorithm is. It even gives very basic code. This could be adapted into C code pretty easily, even though this is not a language that either of us know. This is pseudocode, which is not a real language. You can sort of see what it means. It says write a for loop that goes from i uh, equals zero up to the size minus two and so on. I'm going to see if I can do this from memory. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wander through the array. Uh, I, I'm going to I'll just loop over the array once into i equals zero. i is less than size. Um, 
this should be fine, i less than size, i plus uh, plus. And so what I'll, I'm just using two index variables here. I'm gonna call them i and j. Um, but basically at each step, the index i tells me the first element in the unsorted portion of the array. So when I'm done with each iteration of this loop, the sorted portion of the array will be one step larger. It'll get larger and larger. And then when I'm looking at a particular index, so suppose this had the, this element was 17, what I want to do is search for the smallest thing in the unsorted part of the array. So the smallest thing to the right of this line. I'm going to iterate over all of these indices and find the index j of the smallest thing. So i will always point to the beginning of the unsorted section. j will point to the smallest thing in the unsorted section. So I'm going to use a second loop to find that. So I'll say, okay, um, min, uh, actually, hmm, we'll call this min index. I'm going to need j for a loop index. Okay, so min index, well, as far, I'm going to start that off at i, and then I'm going to loop over all the other possibilities. j equals i, so j is going to start at the same position as i, the beginning of the unsorted section. j equals i, j is less than size, j plus plus. Uh, one quick note about loop ranges. ChatGPT's pseudocode does this. I'm not going to bother, but it's true, though, that um, these the upper bound on these loops doesn't need to be what it is. I could actually reduce this by a couple and nothing would happen. And same story here. I could say J starts at I plus one. That would save a little bit of computer time, but I don't care that much about computer time. I don't mind wasting a couple of operations in the interest of having an algorithm that looks a little bit cleaner and easier to understand at this point. Okay, so basically what I'm doing is finding the smallest thing in this portion of the array. So if A at index J is less than A at index minimum index, then I'm going to set um, minimum index to be J. So when I'm done this loop, I should have a configuration like what I have over here on the right, where min idx points to the smallest thing in the unsorted portion, and i points to the first thing in the unsorted portion. Now what I do is I just exchange those two elements. I put the 6 over here, and I, I just put the 17, for lack of any better location, um, in the position of min index. So I do a swap. So I'll just use a temp variable for that. Um, we'll say int temp equals a at min idx, or a at i, I guess, uh, a at i equals a at min min idx and then a at min idx um, equals uh, temp. And uh, I'm going to test that out. I'm, I might have missed a step, but it'll be pretty obvious whether the stuff gets sorted. So I, I, I compile it. It looks like it compiles fine. I will run it. I'll start with uh, an array that isn't sorted. So 10, 6, 17, done. It gets sorted. I says, it says you entered 10, 6, 17, which I did. I never actually called my sort function, so I will now do that. So I'll say sorting. And then I'll call sort. I'll give it the size. I'll give it my array A. And then I will print out the elements of A again. Uh, okay, so 10, 6, and 17, and done. It sorts into 6, 10, 17. Okay, but that's not enough. I should try testing it on an array of size 1. So done. Looks good. I should try testing it on some kind of larger array. So we'll do 10, 6, 111, negative 116, which of course should be the smallest element. So I'm using negative numbers for a reason. Negative 1, which should be the second smallest. Let's put a 0 in there. Let's put a 187, a 445, and a 485, and then 20, 23. And then I guess I want to throw in at least one other value that is not the largest element so that the largest one isn't at the end. So we'll do 999, and then I press done. And if I stare at it, it looks like it accepted the array of whatever random size I came up with there. And when it's done sorting, everything is in sorted order. Um, and so there was a lot going on there. I did go a bit quickly through that selection sort implementation. Um, there, is, there are other videos I've, I've posted where I talk about that in more detail. And there are other sorting algorithms. If you had to solve this, this exercise, you wouldn't be required to understand or use this particular sorting algorithm, it says do whatever you want. You could ask it, what's bubble sort? What's insertion sort? Or you could say, I don't want to spend much time doing this. Could you recommend a sorting algorithm that's really easy to implement? And then maybe it gives you some hints there. It wouldn't, you couldn't do that on a midterm, but I wouldn't ask this question on a midterm. Uh, and so I think I've done enough testing. I think one more case I want to deal with is, what if all the elements are the same? I want to make sure that still works. Okay, that works. And then just in general, what happens if I have a bunch of duplicates? 
Okay, it looks like it still sorts in that case as well. So I'm going to call it and say that exercise number two, after quite a bit of fiddling around to find a good exercise number two, I think we've now completed exercise number two. So I'm going to, we're going to move on and do the exercise three that ChatGPT originally gave me. Uh, so practice memory three, we'll just queue that up. We'll head on over here. Um, okay, so if we scroll up a bit, uh, I eventually did the this. It's one of its alternate exercise ones. That was my exercise two. This is a neat problem, but as I said, I don't think it needs dynamic allocation. It's just a string problem. Um, and then I, I didn't do this one because I felt like this was mostly a structure question. It's This is dangerously similar to what we did already in a previous video. It just uses malloc in a sort of superfluous way. Uh, but scrolling way up, recall that it did provide a um, this prompt, which was create a book database. So I've got a whole, you know, I said a whole bunch of stuff about its ability to pick good books last time. Implement a structure to hold information about books, including their title. Your program should allow the user to add new books to the database dynamically. Okay, so we'll copy the starter code and then see what we think about it. Um, so it's, it's going to give me a complete program. I'll just paste that right in. All right, so it appears as if what's happening is, um, and I'm not going to modify the starter code, so ChatGPT isn't doing the error checking on scanf that I have generally been doing, but fair enough. It asks the user, how many books do you want to add? It then wants me to dynamically allocate memory for an array of book structures. So here's the book structure. Um, it's got a title, it's got an author, it's got a year. Oh, I'm beginning to wonder if this really is a dynamic memory exercise. Well, we're going to do it anyway. Um, and then we ask it, the user gets asked, enter the title of, of the next book, enter the author, enter the year of publication. Then I print the list of books with their details and I free the dynamically allocated memory. Yeah, you know, this is just a structure exercise. We could have done this exercise in the last video, but whatever, I'll do it. We've had a decent amount of practice with other uses of malloc, so I will do this one exactly as it's written. Um, and I will write a little note here. We, we, we don't actually need malloc for this. And I'll talk, I'll come back to that at the end, but I'll start by doing it as written. So I'm going to make an array uh, of type book. So I'm, I'm going to use malloc to allocate an array of books. So I'll call it all books and I will call malloc. And so I want an array. So how big is the array going to be? It's going to be of size num books. And we can see ChatGPT likes naming variables with this convention, not using underscores like I do, but using this, this convention that's unfortunately called camel case, um, which uh, is used in other languages a lot, but isn't normally considered to be a sort of C thing, um, but I'll, I'll take its word for it. So the number of elements is num books, and the size of each element, well, each element is a book. So I type size of book. And again, good that I have that habit of always using the size of invocation there. And then I'll make a note right now to head on down here. And when I'm done, I'll call free on all books because I use dynamic memory to allocate that. Now, the rest of this appears to be an ordinary structure exercise, but I don't know. It's never too late to have some practice. Inside of the book structure, oh, actually, wait, it says struct book. It doesn't define the book using new style notation, which means that I'm not allowed to do that. I have to call this struct book star instead of just book star. Um, so inside the book structure, it just uses fixed size strings for the title and author. And so I'm going to do that too. There is a way using basically the logic that we saw back in exercise one, where I could read uh, the title from the user in a string of any length. I could accept a title as long as the user wants to give and then use a char star inside my book structure to accept that. And you could try that. I don't know. We'll call that the challenge version of this exercise. But I'm going to do the exercise as written. Um, so read the title and store it in the respective book structure. This does not look very difficult. I know already the title can be a string of length at most 99. So there's one space for the null terminator. So I guess what I want to do is I want to call scanf. I want to say read me a string and then put that string in all books index i dot title. Okay, so what's the deal with the dot? So all books is an array of book objects. So all books index i has type struct book. And that means that it is a struct book. And so I can just use the dot on it. Uh, you're tempted, I think, many people are tempted to want to use the arrow here because there's a star involved in the type. But remember that this variable all books is just an array of struct book objects. The star is only there for the sake of um, uh, eliminating the array notation so that I can call malloc. Um, so, and of course, if you don't believe me, let's see what the compiler says. Um, 
well, the compiler is upset about something else, which is fair. Uh, I'll fix that. So the type of, of this structure is struct book. I've used old style notation. So when I declare the array, I have to make it of type struct book star. But when I use size of, there is no type called book. That's why it's complaining. It's saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what book is. Because the name of the type is struct book, because we're using the old style structure definition. So I'll try that again, and you can see it's not complaining about my scanf. Now, I'm not going to do the thing that I was doing in previous exercises where I use error checking. You know, I check the return value of scanf to see what happened because the, the exercise isn't already doing that. So I'll come back at the end and add that, but for now I'll just leave it the way it is. Um, all right, uh, so enter the author. There we go. Enter the year of publication. Uh, and so here I would want to read it into, uh, I use an ampersand because I'm not reading a string. I'm not reading it into an array. I'm actually reading it into a single variable. It would be dot year. All right. Um, I guess I have to think of a book now. Okay. Um, so we'll compile again. Uh, oh yeah, this is a pretty big problem. There we go. So I use a scanf, I use percent D there because obviously I need to be reading an int. Um, now, I've got to think of a book to enter, and because I don't, if I ask ChatGPT, we're going to get back into that whole thing from last time about what's a book or like why ChatGPT can't think of a better set of books. So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm admitting to doing this, on my other screen, I'm going to pull up the list of books that ChatGPT generated last time after all that prompting, and we'll use that as our test input. Okay, so practice memory three. How many books do you want to add? Okay, let's do, I'm going to start by adding, um, let's do three books. Okay, the three books. Enter the title of book one. Well, I, I recommended last time, I strongly recommended Homegoing, uh, and so we'll enter the details of the, the title and author for that. The publication year happens to, ooh, what happened there? Um, okay, so what seems to have happened is uh, when I tried to read that integer, so the year of publication for book one, something weird happened. Notice how it seems to skip directly to the title of book two. I think I know what the problem is there. So, uh, and this is just a guess. Uh, it, it's going to take a while for me to test this if I keep going with my current test case. I'm going to do a, sm a simpler test case where I enter just two books. Title of book one, uh, I'll do hello world. And then it's going to ask me for a year. I'm going to say 2008, okay? Uh, and I'm going to give my title of book two. And then this author is going to be named Hello World. Uh, notice how the author has two words in their name. And then I get that weird behavior. So just trying that one more time. How many books do you want? Title of book one, Hello World. Um, okay. Uh, and then enter the publication year. What? Why did it skip over the author? So the problem is actually I wasn't taking the exercise seriously enough. I was saying, oh, this is going to be an easy exercise. It's going to be like last time. But I missed an obvious observation that I made last time and I made earlier today, which is that Scanf doesn't read multiple words. Scanf reads... Um, a single word at a time. The title of a book can have multiple words in it. Okay, so what do I do? Well, I've got a couple of options. I could go back to exercise one and I could use getchar to read it. That actually wouldn't be so bad here. Why don't we just do that? I could also use fgets. Um, you maybe noticed this. I like fgets, but I do try to avoid using it um, a lot. And one of the reasons I like avoiding it is because if I use fgets, the call to fgets looks weird and it puts new lines in the strings that it creates. And often I have to go through just as much effort getting rid of that new line as I would reading the thing myself. I'm going to add a, because the thing I'm reading has uh, a specific fixed character count, I could just write a function to say, let's do um, void read string. And this is going to read characters until the end of a line. So we'll say char s um, and then um, int max length. And the idea is, I'll write a specification for this, read string s max length, read up to max length characters uh, from the user into the provided string s. Um, until the uh, a new line is entered. Okay, so actually I should call that uh, not a string but a buffer because it's only a string once I have added a null terminator to it. Uh, all right, so now what I'm going to do is use getchar. I'm going to quickly rewrite that getchar loop I already wrote earlier in this video. I'm going to need an index. I'm going to need a character to work with. I actually, for some reason, would like to put the index first. Okay, there we go. Uh, and so I'm going to say while ch is not equal to a new line and while i 
uh, i is less, oh, actually, hmm, maybe max length, maybe I should say, yeah, I'm gonna say max size minus one. So what the user, what the caller will pass in is the size of the array. And it's my business to make sure that, that I reserve space for the null terminator. I feel like that's closer to what other functions in the C idiom would do. So if you want to read a string of length up to 99, you tell me that max size is 100. And I am in charge of putting that null terminator there at the end. Now, scanf doesn't do that, but everything else, fgetS, for example, does do that. With fgetS, you tell it the total size of the array. fgetS makes sure that there's still space for the null terminator at the end. So i is less than max size minus 1. So if the size of the array is 10, then I need index 9 to be used for the null terminator. So the smallest, the largest value of i that I'm allowed to use for a character would be 8. In other words, i is less than 9, or less than or equal to 8. So that's why I'm writing the loop the way I am. Okay, so at each step, what I do is I say s sub i equals the new character, ch equals get char, and then unlike the previous example where I forgot this, I will remember to increment i. When I'm done, I'll go install my null terminator in s, there we go, and I think that's all I need. So now I will, although I should probably do a bit more testing because I've already written all this stuff, I'm just gonna try plugging it directly in and hope for the best. So I'll read into all books i dot author, or dot title, I will read uh, a string of, into an array of size 100. So the string can be of size at most 99 by the convention that we've defined. And then I'll do the same thing here. Okay, so scanf didn't work because scanf reads single words and a book title obviously might have more than one word. Interestingly, the first test case I actually tried was the book Homegoing, which has a one word title. So the, the bug didn't show up until I began reading the author. How many books do I want to add? Let's do three. Okay, Homegoing. Uh, Home go, uh, how many books? Three. Home going, I'll spell it correctly. Um, okay, uh, year of publication. Oh, it's still, um, it's still not working uh, because I didn't recompile the program. I'm just too eager to finish the example. All right, how many books? Three. Um, yuck. Uh, okay, so I said, how many books do you want to add? Three. And then enter the title of book one, and then it skips over reading the title of book one. So what's going on there? And you know what I think happened is, uh, so I entered three and then a new line. And there was a bunch of space before the title of the book that, that I was going to, or actually, I didn't even get a chance to enter the title of the book because on this line of input, I entered three followed by a new line. Scanf read the digit three, but it didn't read that new line character. That's something that Scanf would have to skip over the next time you call it. Okay, so this is, we're going a little bit off the rails here, but before I read the first character of my string, um, before reading the first character, skip over any white space um, that's, uh, skip over any white space. So in other words, if the user, um, if the user enters, you know, space, 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 this, the string I apparently want, um, the string I want is this. So maybe you can see what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I want to get rid of any spaces, and this includes the spaces that result from new lines. And so if I just use the isSpace function, this exercise is really ballooning outwards in all directions. If I use the isSpace function, I can, I can just skip over all the white space. All right, so we're learning a lot of stuff here. Um, okay, so while the character is not equal, is equal, um, hmm, well, isSpace returns true on this character, then I want to skip over it. So just read the next character. Okay, let's see what happens if I do that. So um, as long as the character I've just read is a space, at least at the beginning, I'm gonna skip over it, just get the next character and keep moving. That means when I finally get to the beginning of my while loop on line 23, I am only reading the characters that actually go into the title. This is gonna help me in a couple of ways. It's not an obvious um, thing to add because the, the bug that I, I just encountered here isn't really obvious and it's very likely if you looked at this, it wouldn't be clear where the bug is happening. So I'm lucky because I've dealt with scanf and user input enough that I could sort of see in, into the future there a bit. But basically, I read the number three and scanf stops right after the number three. Between the number three and what I want to enter is a new line and that's white space. So if I skip white space, I should hopefully be able to get around this bug. 
And if not, then the level of arrogance I've displayed by continuing to say, oh, the code should work now, um, certainly I'm learning a val valuable lesson about being humble. So I'm going to save my file, I'm going to run this, and we're going to hope for the best. How many books? I want three. What's the title of book one? It is Homegoing. Here is the author's name. Um, what is the year of publication? The year of publication was apparently 2016. Enter the title for book two. Let's do The Namesake. Uh, and here's the author's name. Um, and the uh, year of publication is 2003. Enter the title for book three. Um, for this one, let's do this one by, here we go. And uh, the year of publication was 2018. Uh, and of course, I entered all that stuff and then I've forgotten that it, it turns out I actually don't have code to print anything out yet, so I need to do that next. But it looks like I read the input. And what's weird is that even without the code to test it, and I probably should have written that code first, but even without the code to test it, I was able to encounter and fix, hopefully, a couple of bugs. Bugs like how Scanf was working, bugs like how that white space got read. Okay, so print the list of books with their details. Well, for that, I guess I can... I can copy this loop here, um, and I'll just print out for each book. So I'll do printf. Um, in the previous uh, set of exercises, I wrote a function for this, but the point of the exercise mostly is malloc, so I'm, sh I'm taking a few shortcuts. Uh, the title, um, hmm, title of uh, book one is this, and then this will be i, or whoops, i plus one. So we can see ChatGPT is indexing starting at zero, but it generates i plus one, so the user sees counts that begin at one, because users generally don't understand this whole indexing at zero business. Uh, and then, uh, oh, and then I actually have to print the title itself, so all books sub i dot title. Uh, I'm gonna just gonna copy and paste this to print out the author and the publication year, so author, um, and then publication year. And then the publication year is an integer. So I'm printing it with percent %d. We change this, author. All right, now will that compile? Let's try compiling it. We'll do our test. Three, uh, okay, here's the first book there, 2016. Uh, what was the second book again? The second book uh, was The Namesake. Uh, and, um, that was published in 2003. The third book, I think I had this one, and um, let's see, it was that, and that was in 2018. We'll see what it prints out. Okay, so here's my first book. Yep, that's what, it, what, what it's supposed to be. There's my second book. There's my third book. I'm gonna do a couple of other tests. So one other test is I'm gonna see what happens if I add only one book. I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna phone that one in. Hell world, um, that's, we don't know anything about being in hell world, do we? Okay, so uh, we'll try, um, let's do one more. Uh, this is this book I'm planning to read in the next couple of months, in fact. Um, and that's 2017, and it prints that out. Um, so uh, I think by doing a test on three books, I have managed... Uh, I think I can validate that this should work on other sizes. I can do one, I can do three. I could test it on 10 books, but entering them all by hand is a huge pain. Um, although by not testing, I run a certain risk. So I said I was gonna come back at the end of this malloc situation. We don't actually need malloc for this. So I'm declaring the exercise to be complete. I believe it is functional. I, I believe it does work even after all those weird twists and turns. Certainly I was not expecting to have to write all this user input code. Um, if I had used fgetS, I don't think I would have had any easier of a time. In this course, we often try to avoid mixing together line-based uh, strings with spaces as well as integer input because it is a pretty frustrating to have to come to all these conclusions that I came to from scratch. Um, but this was supposed to be a memory allocation exercise. And at the very beginning, I said, well, I have to do it because I've spent all this time arguing with ChatGPT. But I don't think the point of this exercise really is dynamic allocation. And here's why. Although I'm making an array of structures, which is one reason I felt it was useful to show off how to use malloc, because it works the same with structures as with anything else, uh, I really don't need to. I could just allocate it because I know the size. I don't have to resize the array. I could just allocate it the old fashioned way. I could write it like this. So all um, struct book, that's the element type, all books, and then I give the size. So we'll try that out. We'll do one more test. How many books? Oh, I have to compile it first. How many books do I want to add? I'm just gonna do two this time. Okay, we'll do home going. 
and 16. I got to pick another one from, uh, let's do the title of book two. I'm reading off of my book list that ChatGPT gave me last time. Everywhere. Um, and the publication here is 2017. And it works. So because I already know the size of the array, and the array doesn't need to have a lifespan that transcends functions, and the array doesn't need to be resized or anything, I don't need malloc. And ChatGPT seems to think I do, and I suspect that's because until recently, so in, in the world of C at least recently, until the early 2000s, you did need malloc if the size of the array wasn't a constant that you knew in advance, but you don't anymore. And because ChatGPT has learned all of it, of what it knows by digesting the contents of the internet or whatever, it might still be learning a lot from old C exercises that seem to use malloc for everything. But we don't need malloc. We don't even need malloc for any of this exercise. If we were to need malloc for this exercise, I would say the first place we want to use it is in the title and author fields, not in the size of the array. But nonetheless, if you want the malloc version of this, I did write it, so I have completed my memory allocation exercises for today.